So welcome everybody. We're excited to have you in class today. Today is going to be a whirlwind. So hold on. It is going to be 27 amendments in 27 plus a few minutes. We're going to see how far we get through these. My name is Curry Sautner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center. And I'm kind of like your guide through this conversation. But we are here with our top scholar, Tom Donnelly, who's really going to give us the breakdown on every single amendment and kind of how they're grouped together. So as we look at this, this is kind of our goals for the class. And can I have the, the charge to Tom to walk us through this? So Tom, big ideas that we're going to get th through and big questions. How have constitutional amendments transformed the Constitution? Some amendments edit the Constitution, some amend the Constitution, and some transform the Constitution. So you're going to have to point out for us kind of what type of amendment it is as we go through. But even before that, we have to figure out how do you actually change the Constitution? So how do you amend the Constitution? What's the process? Next question is, how do we see these and understand these amendments in groups? They do cluster together in time periods and we'd love to understand why that happens and what was the energy around it. And then finally, we're asking all of you all, what's your favorite amendment, but also what do you think should be the next amendment added to the constitution? So without further ado, pinging it over to Tom to walk us through article five. All right, thank you everyone for being here. And let's talk about the Article 5 amendment process and start where we always do with the Constitution's text. So the amendment process, it's really possible to just boil it down even simpler than that to two main uh, 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 stages. So the first would be, how does an amendment get formally proposed? Well, it has to either secure a two thirds vote in both houses of Congress. So that's two thirds of the US House and two thirds of the Senate or two thirds of the state legislatures have to call for a new convention. So that's either Congress or through the states. That's how you can formally propose a new amendment. Once an amendment is proposed though, that's just the beginning of the process. We then send that amendment along to the states for ratification and there within the states, three fourths of the states have to approve of a proposal for it to be written into the constitution. They can do it either through their state legislatures or through specially elected conventions for the purpose of ratifying the amendment and Congress decides which one, whether it's gonna be state legislatures or ratifying conventions. All but one amendment has been ratified through state legislatures. The exception is the 21st amendment and every amendment has been proposed by Congress. None have come through a, national, a second national convention. And we're gonna have fun when we get to that 21st amendment and we'll talk about the 18th as well combined with that. But a real like big idea of this class and I love this big idea of this class that that amendment process was put in because our constitution is a charter of freedom but future generations might need to adjust that charter. And that's what article five allows us to do. It allows us to improve it and to make it more applicable to today's life. And that amendment process can transform or clean up or clarify the actual constitution. And what I love from last class is our students were like, wow, these aren't that old. And I love that because in their head, when they came into class, they thought the constitution was something from 230 years ago, but it really goes throughout the entire time period. And that's why we thought looking at these big amendments together in a big picture way would be a helpful way to kind of expose all of us to those themes that pop out. And on that note of themes, Tom, what are some of the themes that pop out on groupings? Sure, let, let, I, I, it's possible to separate the amendments out into four different time periods. What's cool about the story is you really see bundles of amendments at particular points in time in American history and really long periods of time where we don't see new amendments. And I love the big idea, Curry, because what it shows us is that the founding generation didn't believe that it knew everything. In fact, they knew that we would learn more things over time and hopefully make the constitution better. And we did it through these four periods. So there's the founding period that you see, and that's where we get the Bill of Rights, the 11th Amendment and the 12th Amendment. Then fast forward 60 years, and we get the Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th after the Civil War. We call it America's second founding. That's You asked about transformations. That's a real transformation. We then fast forward another 40 years into the Progressive Era, and we get four new amendments in roughly a seven-year period from 1913 to 1920. And then through the, what we call sort of the semi-modern era. So from 1933 to 1992, we add eight more amendments in, in little by little, you know, some of them are clustered around the civil rights movement, but more broadly, it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty regular process. And then it's been another roughly 30 years since our most recent amendment. 
Yeah, modern-ish era is what exactly. we're calling <laughs> Kind of modern. Um, okay, so let's start with our foundation, start with the Bill of Rights and kind of look at these in groupings as well. So there's almost like a subgrouping in the Bill of Rights that we look at. Um, and this is, we have it listed out here. And so Tom, walk us through these and then just dive in because we're gonna fly through the Bill of Rights. Yeah, exactly. So we're borrowing these groupings from great friend of the Constitution Center, Akhil Lamar. And so what we get with the Bill of Rights, Curry, remember that what's so cool about this story is the founding generation immediately decided to use the amendment process. And so this is the first Congress. This is James Madison. This is responding to the anti-federalists who criticized the new constitution because it didn't have a Bill of Rights. Well, James Madison in the first Congress tried to change that. Let's walk through these amendments, Curry, starting with the First Amendment. So the First Amendment itself is a bundle of rights. So we don't even need to bundle it with others. And it combines sort of the uh, religious liberty, religious freedoms, freedom of speech, press, assembly, petition. And together what we get there is the big idea. It goes towards this idea of a freedom of conscience. The religion clause is really going to our freedom to believe or not as we wish. Press. Uh, and speech going to our ability to communicate with our fellow citizens, assemble our ability to join together with like-minded Americans, and then finally the right to petition, our ability to write down our complaints, our ideas on paper, and send it off to the government for the government to listen. So when we look at the next two amendments, second and third, they, people do group them together. Um, and I love, I'm going to point out that there's a chapter in the Bill of Rights book from Akhil Amar that walks you through the first 10 amendments and it's almost like poetry. So if you have that Bill of Rights book, definitely read that. I've read that, like, it's really like four pages a million times. It's very small font though, I will say it's a dense four pages. So let's look at these next two amendments, the second and the third. So the Second Amendment goes uh, really to the founding generation's concern first with standing armies. They were concerned about the new national government, the powerful government, creating a professional army and oppressing the people. And so this is building out of the colonial experience of tyranny from British soldiers. But furthermore, this amendment also, as the Supreme Court said in recent decisions, Heller and McDonald protects an individual right to keep and bear arms to protect your home. And so, the, you know, it's not to say you can't have some regulations of these rights. No right is absolute, the Supreme Court has said. But nevertheless, it goes to both this concern about standing armies and an individual right to keep and bear arms. Going to the Third Amendment, which we don't talk about enough because it doesn't come up very often in contemporary debates. But this is this idea that we can't, you know, the founding generation trying to protect us from having to house soldiers in our homes at a time of peace. Again, growing out of concerns about the British Army housing their soldiers in colonial homes under the British Quartering Act. And it stands for this big idea that our home, that our privacy is something that we greatly, greatly value. Now, we're gonna look at the next two is privacy and property rights. But what I love about fifth is it straddles two groups. So let's begin with the fourth, my favorite amendment to talk about. Um, we'll go to the fourth and then we'll kind of see how the fifth jumps into this group and the next grouping. First of the fourth amendment, it is a really exciting one. And, you know, it's easy to really split it up in a couple of parts. One is the question of what is the Fourth Amendment protecting? Well, it's protecting our persons, houses, papers, and effects. Effects meaning just it protects our stuff. And what is it protecting those things from? From unreasonable searches and seizures by the government. The big idea here is that if the government's going to search our person, our house, our stuff, it needs a really good reason. It can't just rummage around willy-nilly however it wants to. And this is also the general principle that's behind the warrant requirements. We wanna limit the ability of the government to just go, you, you can imagine why this is important. Sometimes maybe the, maybe the government wants to rummage around uh, dissenters, political dissenters. And so it's a way of avoiding those abuses and making sure that we protect our property and our privacy. Absolutely, and then fifth, how's fifth connected to privacy of property? So yeah, if you read the final little portion of the Fifth Amendment there, it's the takings clause. And Madison, this was one that he put in there himself. I don't think it came from other uh, uh, recommendations of the state conventions, et cetera, but it really speaks to the founding generation's commitment to property rights. And the idea here being if the government is going to take your property, it has to be for public use, and then it has to pay you a fair price for it. So it's really honoring uh, the founding generation's commitment to the importance of property to independent citizenship. And so fifth straddles the next group, which is really looking about a fair process in if you're convicted or if you're accused that you have the right to a fair and open process. 
Yeah, so we're bringing together the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth. It's fair process, it's jury rights, it's rights of the accused. Let's start with the rest of the fifth. And there, what you're gonna get from the fifth is, you know, again, we're bringing in some protections for the rights of the accused. The most famous of these is the right against self-incrimination. So this is what we get from the famous Miranda case, the idea what you see in the police shows on television, you have the right to remain silent. That's the right against self-incrimination in the Fifth Amendment. Or if you're asked a question, you say, I plead the Fifth. That's right there. That The, the Fifth you're pleading is the Fifth Amendment. And so with the, the Fifth Amendment, you get those rights of the accused. You also get this big idea of due process of law, that the government can't take away your life, liberty, or property without a fair process being put in place. So that's the Fifth Amendment. As we get into the Sixth Curry, what we see is that we layer more protections there for people accused of crimes. And so the founding generation really concerned about the possibility of government prosecutors, even judges, abusing their power and wrongfully accusing and convicting people of crimes. And so with the Sixth Amendment, we bring in the right to a jury trial in criminal cases. That jury, that jury trial is going to be speedy. It's going to be an impartial jury, so you're going to be tried in front of your peers. And so if the government is going to throw you in jail, they're going to have to prove it in front of people like you. And so that's a very important, uh, important right. The other big one here is the right to counsel, which we get from the famous case of Gideon versus Wainwright. And there, the idea being that if we're going to convict people, we don't want it to be because they're poor, they can't afford lawyers. We want it to be because they're guilty. The best way we can provide a fair process is to make sure that everyone is well lawyered. And so uh, Mary shared that she knows a lot about the Seventh Amendment because she had to present on it. And I love that idea. The more you present on these, the more you know about them. So um, Seventh Amendment, very important to kind of look at this idea of that right to a trial over larger spaces, not just in one area or the other. Exactly. So the sixth is bringing in the criminal jury trial. The seventh is making sure that we have a trial in civil cases. So these are generally cases that involve money. And again, this was another amendment really, really important to the anti-federalists, those who opposed the new constitution. And so James Madison, the first Congress, made sure that it was in the constitution. And then finally, in this bundle, we go to the Eighth Amendment, which provides protections against excessive bail, excessive fines, cruel and unusual punishment. And again, this grows out of certain anti-federalists like Patrick Henry, concerned that we're creating this new, big, powerful national government. And they're concerned that that government's gonna create weird laws that oppress the people, and they want to make sure that there are limits on that written into our constitution. And one of the things that we talked about in an earlier class was what does cruel and unusual mean? Like, how do you define those words? Because this one is always one that's fascinatingly looked at at different time periods and then to the current conversation as well. And then I add it that I fact that I want to add an Eighth Amendment class, just so we're clear. Oh, absolutely. Oh, <laughs> right? that'd be great. <laughs> okay, the last two amendments, nine and 10. Popular sovereignty amendments. Sure, so the Ninth Amendment, for many scholars, they argue that the Ninth Amendment brings in this idea of natural rights. I think the big idea behind the Ninth Amendment is that the founding generation was concerned that in writing down certain rights in the Bill of Rights, we may think that that's the only rights that the people have. And what the Ninth Amendment does is it declares, no, 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 that's not the way to read the Constitution. We need to read the Constitution in a rights expansive way. And furthermore, what this reinforces is concerns to make sure that we're limiting the powers of the national government. And so just because we haven't listed a right in the Ninth Amendment doesn't mean that that right should be disrespected or that it doesn't exist. And then finally, the Tenth Amendment speaks to federalism, this longstanding, <laughs> never ending argument over which powers go to the national government, which powers go to the states. The founding moment is giving more powers to the national government. The Tenth Amendment is about saying, no, 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 the states are still important. The states still have their traditional powers and we will ma maintain those even after we have a new constitution. And I always think ninth and 10th are like catch all amendments. So they like ended the bill of rights with these just in case the people still have power and the states still have power. They was kind of like, keep it safe. You don't have everything federal government. And then we roll in with the 11th and 12th still in that founding period. Yeah, so these are two more we add after the bill of rights. The 11th amendment was in 1795. And so what this is doing is it's protecting, just as Kennedy would say, it was protecting the dignity of the states. And so the concern of the anti-federalists was under the new constitution, ordinary citizens would be able to complain from another state, would be able to complain about what a certain state was doing and they'd be able to sue them in national courts. And so an ordinary citizen in South Carolina could bring Georgia into court saying you're doing something bad. Anti-federalists concerned about this. There's an early Supreme Court case called Chisholm, which actually says anti-federalists, you were right to be concerned. Ordinary citizens can bring states into courts. 
And so what we did is we passed the 11th Amendment very shortly thereafter. It took under a year to ratify it, saying, no, 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 Supreme Court, you were wrong in Chisholm. We're going to protect the dignity of the states, the sovereignty of the states here. And so this is one of many examples of the American people using the amendment process to say, no, 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 Supreme Court, you got it wrong. And here's the right answer. And that's fascinating as students have asked, like, how much does the amendment define it? How much do the courts define it? And this was the courts were defining it in one way and the people changed it with an amendment. Almost the reverse of that. And the 12th Amendment, which we could talk forever about because it's such a fascinating case, but real quick, 12th Amendment, simply what is it set up? Well, yeah, so it's altering the Electoral College. So we learned something from our, some of our early presidential elections, 1796, where we have John Adams defeat Thomas Jefferson, and then 1800, where we have Thomas Jefferson beating John Adams. We had some problems there. The original Electoral College had the electors vote for two people for president. And the thing to remember about the original Constitution and the founding generation, they didn't know that we were going to have political parties. So this system seemed to make sense where it's like, ah, whoever gets the most votes and whoever gets the second most votes, one gets to be president, one gets to be vice president. What we saw is political parties developed really quickly. And so even by 1796, John Adams is associated with the Federalists. Thomas Jefferson, the Democratic Republicans. And then we have the Federalist finish first, the Democratic Republican finish second, Adams is president, Thomas Jefferson, vice president. That didn't work out very well. Imagine Donald Trump being the vice president for Joe Biden. It's not the greatest system in the world. And then the other thing we saw was when you had these two separate votes for president in the election of 1800, we had running mates get the same number of votes, Thomas Jefferson, Aaron Burr, everyone knew Thomas Jefferson was at the top of the ticket, but Burr said, eh, I have a chance to be president, House, vote me in. And eventually the House selected Jefferson, but we decided this wasn't a great way to run our presidential elections when there's political parties. The 12th Amendment gives electors now two separate votes, one for president, one for vice president. This ensures, in, 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 this is meant to ensure that the president and vice president are gonna come from the same party. Yeah, and Colin points out, I can't even imagine. Every time you think of how it could have been over the last, all the elections, it never really turns out well. Like you could never combo it in this, like before the 12th, the way that it would, it would not work. Three, now these next three amendments are really game changers. These structurally change the constitution's power. Congress gets more power. These are really ones that are immensely changing. And that's why we call this the second founding. So I know this is gonna be hard for you, Tom, but you have about three minutes to walk through these three amendments. Uh, <laughs> all right, are, so these in a few weeks, we're gonna go deep dive into them. So don't worry people. <laughs> And I'll complain about not having enough time then too. But the, these <laughs> amendments are the 13th, 14th, and 15th. We added the, them to the Constitution after the Civil War. We often refer, refer to them as America's second founding, and they really, really were. So let's just walk through what we're getting through these amendments. Well, let's start with the 13th Amendment. This is the first of the three. And simply put, it abolishes slavery. And so, you know, we, we may have made some efforts during the Civil War, Lincoln with the Emancipation Proclamation, freeing some enslaved people. With well, the 13th Amendment, what we said there is that the Civil War at the very least means immediate, uncompensated emancipation. It means that enslaved people are enslaved no more. And it gives Congress, you see there in section two, the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. What you'll see across the 13th, 14th, and 15th is an expansion of national power. And so the Bill of Rights was about making sure the national government didn't have a lot of power. The Reconstruction Amendments are about expanding national power. The 14th Amendment then does so many different things. So it makes everyone born on American soil a US citizen. So this is another example. We, the people speaking back and saying, Supreme Court, you got it wrong in Dred Scott. We say it right there in the first line of the 14th Amendment. And then the amendment also writes the Declaration of Independence's promises, promise of equality into the Constitution, equal protection of the laws for all person. The Constitution was silent on the issue of equality before the 14th Amendment, and then it's written right there with the 14th Amendment. The other really big thing here, Curry, is that the original Bill of Rights only applied to the national government, but the language here in the 14th Amendment, we extend those Bill of Rights protections to the states. Remember, the states were abusing key rights before the Civil War. You had Southern states banning abolitionist speech, preaching assembly, saying African-Americans can't assemble in religious gatherings, saying that enslaved people can't be taught how to read. The 14th Amendment was about protecting those liberties everywhere. Awesome, 15th Amendment, vote. And so the 15th Amendment expands, it's sort of the, the, the last part of the second founding where it's saying, okay, we've gotten rid of slavery, we've promised civil rights to everyone, and now with the 15th Amendment, we're looking to expand political rights. 
And so what we're doing is we're banning racial discrimination in voting and we're giving Congress the power to enforce this article. So we're bringing African-Americans into the we, the people that have their voting rights protected. And of course, as we know, Curry, tragically, this, does, this period of, of great promise and transformation doesn't last that long. It does last for a time. We do really have interracial democracy, even in the South, during this period where we have African-American governors, members of Congress, senators, all the way down to local levels of government. So this worked for a brief period of time, but too brief. And so we, we see a backlash against these amendments. We see Jim Crow spread throughout the South and mistreatment of African-Americans, violence, intimidation, state laws, discriminating against African-Americans. And it would take another hundred years and decades upon decades of courage, bravery, fight, court cases, politicians committing to this cause until finally with the civil rights movement, we end up with two landmark statutes enforcing these protections, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And again, a nod to the First Amendment for the protests and the assemblies and the parades and petitions that went along with making that change in the 1960s. Now the progressive era. So this is, we're looking at amendments that are added in this seven year time period. And there's a lot of change on the, this kind of period. And this is actually really a fun one to look through because the amendments are very different, but that when you dig into the history, they're, they're connected in so many ways. So what is the theme in this area? And then what is the progressive era? What, what is that time period really defining for America? Well, yeah, this is the period, uh, it's in the early 20th century, and I'd say there are two big ideas of constitutional reform, which you'll see in these amendments and are consistent with the progressive cause more broadly in this era. One is you're seeing a push to have the government do more, and so this could give the government more power to do things like tax, which we'll see in the 16th Amendment, or to advance moral causes like prohibition, which we'll see in the 18th Amendment. The other big thing is continuing to work to reform American democracy. So working on the democratic system and pushing for ways that the progressive movement thought improved the constitution. So let's start with the 16th. It's maybe the easiest way to see an expansion of government power. What the 16th Amendment says is that Congress has the power to pass income taxes. Now this was a debate for decades. We saw during the Civil War, the national government imposed its first income tax. Then we saw the Supreme Court in a case called Pollock say, no, 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 Congress does not have the power to pass an income tax. Then we see a social movement arise against the Supreme Court decision for decades saying, no, no, the national government has this power under the original constitution. It needs it again. We need a constitutional amendment. And finally, the 16th amendment clearly gives Congress the power to pass an income tax. This, it's ratified in 1913. 1913, we pass our first income tax under the new amendment. We've had one ever since. If we move on to the 17th amendment, this is another amendment ratified in 1913. So this, again, this is a seven year period, four amendments ratified, two in 1913. The 17th amendment is about rebalancing power in Congress. Um, and specifically what it does, the original constitution left the election of US senators to state legislatures. And the 17th amendment puts in place the system we have today, which is that voters directly elect their US senators. And you know, one way to think about this is the reformers were arguing what you would take to be the simplest argument here, which is the, most, the, the system that's most, commit, uh, most consistent with the American commitment to popular sovereignty ruled by we the people. And furthermore, most consistent with the trend towards more and more democracy over time that we see throughout American history is a system where we the people elect our senators directly. So that's the 17th Amendment. And I can't believe that was 1913. It feels so late in the game. Amazing. Absolutely. Okay, so we can do 18 and 21 together because they really do bookend each other perfectly. So 18th Amendment. And again, I just pointed out to everybody, I love the icons here. They crack me up. <laughs> I don't think I've ever noticed that one. That's, that's really... Okay, so the 18th Amendment, as the icon shows us, this is the Prohibition Amendment. This is banning alcohol. Smashing alcohol. <laughs> exactly. Throughout the United States. And again, this is consistent with the progressive movement of the time. This is a product of a bunch of social movements working together for almost 100 years to push for prohibition. Um, so these are the progressives, suffragists, some populists. You see a lot of different groups pushing for this change. Um, and you know what you end, and one thing to note, Curry, is we, you know, one lesson we learned from this and we, we look back on is like the American people sometimes can put an amendment in place and think that it was a bad idea and get rid of it. So we do this, the 18th Amendment is that is uh, what year is that? That is 1919. And then just 13 years later, we decide to repeal it with the 21st Amendment. So sometimes, you know, one way to look at this is even reformers make mistakes. The other thing to keep in mind, though, is that the, that the 18th Amendment was responding to a real societal problem. 
Americans drank a lot. And this broke down families. This had people drinking away their life savings. This had, you know, people, you know, leaving their, 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 their families and children. It, there, there were serious problems that many of these reformers were responding to. And so, you know, we decided to do prohibition. And then as Curry has here, the 21st Amendment, you know, 13 years later, we say, no, 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 we don't like that idea. And Section 1 gives you the, I get so direct. It says the 18th Article of Amendment to the Constitution of the United States is hereby repealed. It's very simple. That's a very simple uh, a statement of what's going on. And, you know, the, the question is, why did we decide to repeal it so quickly? Well, in part, you know, the simplest response may be the American people wanted legal access to alcohol. But the other is that, you know, I think a lot of Americans came to view prohibition as a noble but failed experiment. It was really, really hard to enforce. We had a big black market for alcohol. This resulted in or a more organized crime. Law enforcement couldn't do anything about it. And Amer a lot of Americans became outraged that prohibition became a symbol of the breakdown of the constitutional order and the rule of law. And so we had a backlash against it that results in the 21st Amendment and repeal. And again, it's such a fascinating time period to look at of what were the positive changes and the negative changes. Like <clears throat> unbelievable, like domestic violence towards children and women before the 18th, uh, the 18th Amendment, that drops, alcoholism drops, uh, social constructs, everybody's going into speakeasies, changes how women and men and African-Americans are mixing with white Americans and everybody is breaking the law together in some ways, but it's a lawless nation and that's the negative. So there's so many things to kind of look at with this that we now wanna do a class on that. But I would also check out Dan Okren's book and we'll send it to you in the roundup. Um, 18th Amendment, now the 19th Amendment, a lot of our favorites as well. So 19th Amendment, lay it out for us. Yeah, so this is the Women's Suffrage Amendment. So this is giving women the right to vote. Um, it draws its language. The language is identical other than substituting sex for race from the 15th Amendment. This is one of the great trends and one of the great stories in American constitutional history where we've done a series of amendments that have gradually expanded the right to vote to more and more groups. Race with the 15th, sex with the 19th, age with the 26th. Um, and the 19th Amendment is also a really cool story in that what it shows is, again, a social movement, the suffragists working for decades upon decades for this change. But we also see the dynamics, the value of, of federalism and state experimentation. Because part of this story is that out West, states began to grant women the right to vote. It worked well, more states adopted it over time. And so by the time we ratified the 19th Amendment, many, many states, including big states like New York, allowed women to vote. And then we decided that experiment at the state level worked and we're gonna write it into the US Constitution with the 19th Amendment. So our next grouping is the modern-ish era, the 1930s to the 1990s, uh, because you know we're moving into the future era now. So 20th Amendment, really kind of, this is what I consider like an editing amendment. It clarifies and just edits the constitution because there wasn't enough information in there before. 20th Amendment lays, uh, like puts more information into the constitution. Yeah, the 20th Amendment is just a simple change where, you know, the way the Constitution was originally, you'd have elections in November, the new Congress and presidency would take over in March of the next year. And what the 20th Amendment does is move that date up to January. And so it limits the, the amount of time between an election and a new government. So we hit 21st already. So let's go to 22nd. The 22nd Amendment goes back to George Washington, George Washington's elected president. He's reelected. And then he says, I am not going to run again. This set an important precedent for future presidents that everyone followed until FDR. FDR is elected four times. And after that, we the people said, no, 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 we don't want that to happen again. We want to go back to the George Washington precedent. And we, we felt so strongly about this that we wrote it into the Constitution with the 22nd Amendment. Uh, 23rd. The 23rd Amendment brings Washington, D.C. into presidential elections. So Washington, D.C. still doesn't have representation in Congress, but, the, but with the 23rd Amendment, we gave Washington, D.C. three electoral votes. This was significant. It was ratified in 1961, and it was a way during the civil rights era to bring a large block of African-American voters into the presidential election process. And the 24th. The 24th Amendment also ratified during the civil rights era in 1964. And so what it does is it, it bans poll taxes in national elections. So poll taxes were these state laws where that forced people to pay in order to be able to vote. It was designed to try to keep African-Americans from being able to vote. When the 24th Amendment's ratified, you still have, I think, five states that have poll taxes in place. 
we've had the Supreme Court in d- the decades before that say, no, a poll tax is constitutional. And with the 24th Amendment, we speak back and say, no, that's not right. We ban poll taxes in national elections. And a few years later, the Supreme Court in a case called Harper says, you know, we're going to apply that also to state and local elections. And this is 1965, right? If I'm getting the year right. That is, what do I have? 1964 is what I wrote down. 64, got it. So I knew it was right on that. I just like to point that out because 24th is 64. And then just a few years later, we get the 25th Amendment. And then we roll into the 26th Amendment. So these are really kind of tight time periods that these three are coming out. Yeah, so the 25th is 1967. And it's dealing with two things that, that we, we wanted to settle in our constitution. Are, are a few different things. One, what happens when a president dies? Two, what happens when a president has to replace a vice president? And three, what do we do when a president is incapacitated and can't do their duties as president? And so each section of this amendment lays out the process for each of those scenarios. In part, this was a response to the tragic assassination of JFK. And that really focused the nation's mind on trying to settle some of these unsettled issues. And then the 26th Amendment, the fastest. The 26th Amendment is the fastest amendment. It's ratified in 1971, ratified in four months four months. And so what this does is it protects the right to vote for those 18 and older. Before the 26th Amendment, most states set the voting age at 21. This amendment reduced it. It was in response to the Vietnam War, at least in part, where we had people drafted and dying in Vietnam, but unable to vote at home because they were under the age of 21. The 26th Amendment responded to that. Awesome. So when we're looking at these voting rights amendments, the 15th, the 19th, we're looking at the 26th, um, a question that came in from the Hobgood class is a, uh, the question from the class, Union Pines class. How does the suffrage amendment align to the Voting Rights Act and what potential changes to voting rights currently before the Supreme Court? Um, the poll tax is almost wrapped in here as well, which is why I wanted to get through the poll tax uh, amendment as well. These amendments can give Congress the right to enforce the laws, but it seems that the Supreme Court has fluctuated between giving the federal government or the states the authority to govern and enforce the election laws? Good question, great question, multifaceted. Mm -hmm. So before we get to the 27th, you wanna dive into that real quick? Absolutely, so two two quick responses to that. One is there's absolutely a through line between the 19th Amendment and the Voting Rights Act. I'm glad that you saw that because part of the reason is the 19th Amendment may end sex discrimination and voting, But women of color still have to fight for decades and decades arm in arm with African-American men to actually secure the right to vote and practice in the South. And so they continue to fight for decades after that, culminating in the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which the Supreme Court in a case called South Carolina versus Katzenbach said is consistent with the enforcement powers under the 15th Amendment. And then you're right, too, that so many of the debates now before the Supreme Court and among scholars who work in voting rights remain over how broadly does the national government's power sweep under these enforcement clauses. With scholars disagreeing with this, we see this really laid out in the case of Shelby County versus Holder from 2013. So read Chief Justice Roberts's majority opinion, read Justice, uh, Justice Ginsburg's dissenting opinion and see who you agree with because they, they both really lay out those positions in strong ways. Awesome, let's wrap up the 27th Amendment real quick, but we do have a bunch of really good questions about the 22nd um, and the 24th Amendment, but I'll let you, uh, Tom, I think you were gonna be on time without my questions. <laughs> so do the 27th real quick and then we'll wrap in the extra questions. So yeah, so the 26th Amendment shortest to ratification, the 27th Amendment by far the <laughs> longest, it takes over two centuries. So the 27th Amendment, written by James Madison, approved by the first Congress, and ratified in 1992. And it's this amazing story where it it, it grew out of the work of a disgruntled sophomore at the University of Texas, Gregory Watson, who wrote a paper on what became the 27th Amendment, arguing that we the people could still ratify it. He got a C. He got a C and he got really angry. And so he said, I'm going to get this thing ratified. And so he wrote to legislators. He had a powerful senator from Maine, William Cohen, think it was a great idea. The two of them kept pushing and eventually we ratified it again in 1992. And why, why would we ratify it then in part? It was because people were really disgruntled with Congress. And this, this amendment uh, limited Congress's ability to give itself a pay raise. And so it really dovetailed nicely. It was a concern for the founding generation. It was a concern for people in the 1990s. So it unifies those two different generations. Awesome. Okay. So now we have a few more questions, everybody. So I know if you need to jump, that's okay. We totally understand. Classes officially come together. We want you to ponder 
the question, what would be your 28th amendment? But a few clarifying questions are gonna bring us home on the 22nd and the 24th. So let's start with the first one that came in that's actually on the 24th amendment. So when you look at the 24th amendment, the first question was, is this federal elections or state elections? And then the follow-up question was, which SCOTUS case extends the 24th to state elections? So the 24th amendment itself, its text deals with national elections. Um, and so it's, it's limited in that sense. The Supreme Court case is a case called Harper and it doesn't extend, it doesn't technically, it's a, it, technically it doesn't extend the 24th amendment to state and local elections, but what it does is it basically reads the 24th amendment together with the promise of equality in the 14th amendment and say that poll taxes in state and local elections are unconstitutional. So with the 24th amendment combined with the Supreme Court's decision in Harper, we ban poll taxes in all level of elections. Awesome, great. It's sort of a two, it's a two step where it's the constitution's text combined with the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court also, part of it, the Voting Rights Act, we talked about that before. One of the findings in the vote, when we were doing the Voting Rights Act was that poll taxes are a serious problem. And so the court even took notice of that as, as a component of the argument. So it's a bit of constitutional change. It's a bit of what Congress is saying. It's a bit of what the president's mm -hmm. saying and a bit of what the Supreme Court rules that extends these protections to all level of government. Awesome, fascinating. Um, and, and now 24th is going up there is one of my favorites to learn more about. Um, what was the 22nd, this is from Emily, what was the 22nd amendment put forth by Congress in part to ensure that the specific president that was in office at the time wouldn't be reelected? I understand that it was a very important concept. I am just curious if the party lines had any part in passing this amendment at a specific time. And I always wonder around like, did they keep it 10 to just sanction Truman a little? <laughs> Well, yeah, so there, there, there is that part of it where the very simple thing, way to describe it is to say a president can only run for re-election once, and so you can serve two terms. But there is this time limit in there for someone like Truman, who takes over for a lot of FDR's final term, and then therefore it limits it, the time in office to 10 years to basically say, Truman, you can't run for re-election. Um, you know, the answer is, where did this reform push come from? It was a, originally, it was the Republican Party very angry about FDR running for that fourth term. And so that is what the agitation came out of that interest in making sure that it didn't happen again. But I would say that it, that, that interest, though, maybe, maybe it was initially partisan, reflected a broader concern. I mean, it was certainly the case that, you know, FDR was breaking a longstanding precedent. We beloved George Washington. We're concerned about a president having too much power. And so there's a way in which, you know, it certainly extends well beyond to improve any amendment, you're gonna need cross-partisan, cross-ideological support. And so I think it was a combination of both a response to FDR, but also really resonated with broader constitutional concerns that people had. Awesome. Um, so as we end class, I'm gonna just add a few 28th amendments. So Robert shared that, um, Robert's 28th Amendment changed the standard of public figures have to meet a higher standards associated with libel and slander. Uh, mm -hmm. And Hester's class, a student suggests, one of my students here suggests that the 28th Amendment would be to remove the native born requirement and instead institute a residency and educational requirement. I love that All one. Right. I have not yeah. heard that one in a while and it's awesome. <laughs> Very cool. I love any new idea that comes out there. Um, yeah. Thank you, Tom, so much. This was a great class. I think you almost made it perfectly on time, but, but we love student questions. So we, ah, sorry, yes. we went over, but we love to hear your thoughts, your ideas, and your questions.